everyone. Today we're going to go through how to use quotation marks and dialogue in a narrative. So firstly, we're going to go through how to use quotation marks, the three different purposes of dialogue in a narrative, and how to use dialogue effectively in a narrative. So firstly, there are three ways to set out spoken words enclosed by quotation marks. The first way is after unspoken words to introduce the spoken words. For example, Jack asked, comma, are we going soon? So you can clearly see here that the actual spoken words are the only words that are enclosed inside the quotation marks. The second way is after the spoken words. For example, in a minute, said his mother. So you can see here that the actual words again are enclosed inside the quotation marks and it's separated by a comma before the unspoken words. And the third way is between unspoken words which interrupt the spoken words. For example, in a minute, said his mother, just be patient. So you can see here again, the actual spoken words are the only words that are enclosed in the quotation marks. The spoken words are separated from the rest of the sentence by the following punctuation marks. Number one, commas. She said, comma, you look cheerful. Or, you look cheerful, comma, she said. So here, for the unspoken words that introduce the spoken words, you've got the comma. And the comma also appears after the actual spoken words before the unspoken words. The second punctuation mark is question marks. What is that you're carrying? Question mark, he asked. And the third one is exclamation marks. How dare you? Exclamation point, she screamed. So after any unspoken words, the spoken words continue without a capital letter unless a new sentence begins. So when you continue the same sentence, well, he sighed, comma, what have you got to say for yourself? So the words, well, what have you got to say for yourself are within the one sentence, which is why it starts with a lowercase letter in the second part of the quotation. Number two, when a new sentence begins. You look cheerful, she said, full stop. Okay, so that's one sentence, which is why the next part starts with a capital letter. Have you won the lottery? Another thing to consider is that when there is a change of speaker, a new line starts. So the right way to set this out is where new speakers start on a new line. For example, do you understand quotation marks yet? Asked Peter. It's really hard to know where they go, replied Bill. It's just as well we're not writing this conversation down then, said Peter, as opposed to all in one big blob. Okay, so you really need to separate um, each speaker on a new line. So the wrong way is to write it like this. Do you understand quotation marks yet? Asked Peter. It's really hard to know where they go, replied Bill. It's just as well we're not writing this conversation down then, said Peter. So what I want you to do now is add quotation marks and other punctuation to the following sentence. Mr. President, Mr. Smith said seriously, you're needed in the crisis room immediately. So what I want you to do now is to just pause the video and add the quotation marks and other punctuation. Pause the video now. So how did you go? The answer is open quotation mark, Mr. President, comma, closing quotation mark, Mr. Smith said seriously, comma, open quotation mark, 
You'll need it in the crisis room immediately. Full stop, closing quotation mark. So now we're going to go over how to include dialogue in a narrative to make it to make it elevate the quality of your writing piece. So dialogue in general has three different purposes. So the first purpose is to reveal characters' personalities and relationships. So you can show through the dialogue whether the characters like or dislike each other, how long they have known each other, and how old they are. So here's a piece of dialogue that shows the characters' personalities and the relationships. George asked Frank, have you seen my new computer game? George smiled slyly. No, of course not. Why would I have? It's just, I had it in a box in our room and now, now I can't find it anywhere. I looked under my bed and in the cupboard. I spent a lot of money on it. I can't have lost it. Frank tugged on his lip and tried to hold back the tears. Why don't you look on your desk? George suggested. Great idea. Thanks, George. You're a great brother. He flashed a huge smile and sprinted off to his room. George smirked and patted the game hidden under his seat. He'll never find it, he cackled. So here are a few discussion questions that I want you to think about. How old do you think George is? What evidence supports this? How old do you think Frank is? What evidence supports this? What is George's personality like? What evidence supports this? And what is Frank's personality like? What evidence supports this? So what I want you to do now is pause the video and write down your answers to these questions. Pause the video now. So how did you go? Let's answer the first question. How old do you think George is? What evidence supports this? So I'd say that George is about 12 to 13. He seems quite cheeky and likes to play pranks. And you can tell that Frank looks up to him. How old do you think Frank is? What evidence supports this? So I'd say Frank is slightly younger than George, but not too far in age because they are sharing a room. So about six to eight and you can tell because he's crying easily because he has lost his game. What is George's personality like? What evidence supports this? So I'd say that George can be a little bit cruel because he takes pleasure in tormenting Frank. And you can tell that it's not really the first time that he's done this. What is Frank's personality like? What evidence supports this? So you can, you can tell that Frank is cheerful but naive and innocent and he does look up to his brother. So even if your answers are not exactly the same, if they're kind of close, that should be fine as well. Okay, so the second purpose of dialogue is to reveal information and to move the story forward. So here's an example. You there, with the black beanie, stop. The police officer puffed heavily as he held his baton high in the air. He had been chasing the criminal for what seemed like hours, but was still as far behind as he had ever been. You'll never catch me, the black clad robber shouted. I'm the worst mastermind this town has ever seen. Okay, so here are some discussion questions. What is happening in the story? And how fit do you think the police officer is and why? So what I want you to do now is to pause the video and answer the questions. Okay, let's answer these questions. What is happening in the story? So there's clearly a chase between a robber and a policeman. How fit do you think the police officer is and why? So you can see that he's not very fit as he can't seem to keep up with the criminal and is puffing heavily. 
So the third purpose of dialogue is to create tension and suspense in a narrative. So here's an example. Gemma, do you hear that ticking sound? What ticking sound? Dawn held a finger up to her mouth, indicating to Gemma to be quiet. That ticking sound. Dawn was always hearing things. It was the only thing Gemma didn't like about her friend. Don't be ridiculous. I don't hear anything. I'm positive there's a ticking noise. Almost like I said, don't be ridiculous. The only way to deal with Dawn was to ignore her. And so Gemma picked up her pencil and lost herself in the maths problem once again. She was quite happily working until she noticed, to her shock, a faint sound. Almost like, actually, I do hear something. Gemma's voice trailed off. She felt a cold chill down her spine. I think it's coming from your pencil case. So answer the following questions. How does the author create tension and suspense in the story? And where are the characters? How do we know this? Pause the video now and answer these questions. So how does the author create tension and suspense in the story? Okay, so a problem was introduced, the ticking sound, and this problem was compounded through the use of dialogue and through a small action sequence to keep the story moving forward. For example, Dawn held a finger to her mouth to listen. Gemma was annoyed by Dawn as she was always hearing things and ignores her, continuing with her work. Then Gemma finally hears the noise. So this is compared to Dawn hears a ticking sound, then Gemma responds with, it's coming from your pencil case. All right, so the fact that they've included, the fact that they've included the small action sequence followed by, you know, uh, Gemma feels that the, the cold chill running up and down her spine really adds to the tension and suspense in the story. So the second question is, where are the characters and how do we know this? So the characters are at school and we know that because Gemma was doing maths problems. So what you want to avoid most of all is the talking head scenario where you just write down what the characters say without including any action. So if we go back to the last piece that we read, if we, if we removed all of the action sequences and and all of the commentary then it would sound really really boring okay so let's just try that right now and see how different it feels Gemma do you hear that ticking sound what ticking sound that ticking sound don't be ridiculous I don't hear anything I'm positive there's a ticking noise almost like I said don't be ridiculous actually I do hear something I think it's coming from your pencil case even though it's still quite dramatic, it's not, as, it's not as effective as all the commentary and all of the details that come in the, the piece. All right, so what you need to do is revise the piece of dialogue below, include action as well as dialogue, and have people do things as they are speaking and describe how they are saying things. So for example, when you are revising this piece of dialogue, Decide where the conversation is taking place, what has just happened, what is the character's relationship, what is the purpose of the dialogue. Then determine the actions each character would make before and after saying their line as well as how they say it. So it can be big actions or it can be small actions like in the previous example where Gemma just picked up her pencil again and started just working through her maths problems. Okay, it could be as simple as a character also just putting down a glass on a table. All right, so what I want you to do is just to try it out and I will show you an example in the next part. So pause the video now and see if you can try this out. Okay, how did you go? So... The example that I have is 
Danny shoves a piece of paper in Mike's face and waves it around. What do you think? He asks loudly. He stares at Mike, his eyebrows raised. Trembling with fear, Mike whispers, I don't know. His voice is barely audible. So I'm going to leave you now with another exercise where you need to revise the piece of dialogue below, include action as well as dialogue, have people do things as they are speaking and describe how they are saying things. So person one will say, I can't believe it's you. Person two says, believe it. And person one responds with, this isn't good. All right. So good luck with that. That's all I have for you today. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.